All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this um, immersion into your heart and into the passions of the bridegroom. And and we ask you once again, Father, in this uh, next hour to help us. Father, I ask that you would increase our capacity, Lord, that, that you would enlarge our hearts and our minds and our spirits to receive more. I pray out of Ephesians 3 that, that, Father, you would send your spirit into our hearts to strengthen us to receive more of the knowledge of your love. Strengthen us, even in this moment, Lord, to receive more. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. E-School students, we welcome you, bless you. I pray that your hearts would be enlarged even as you uh, listen to the internet stream, the web stream, or watch the DVDs that the Lord would grace you as well. All right, we're going to pick up in uh, chapter 6, verse 4. I want to take just a moment before we get into the text itself to, to respond to one of the comments that came up through uh, during the break. One of the guys came up and, and said, you know, I had some, had some history with some Eastern meditation kinds of things, and one of the phrases they used was, let the universe come fill you and be in you as you. And, uh, and so when I used that phrase about how Christ wants to live in us as us, that it was kind of disconcerting, and, and, and so I want to just speak to that for a second. The enemy loves to steal our stuff. See, that, that phrase doesn't belong to med- the meditative, you know, Eastern mysticism world. That phrase belongs to us. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the biblical reality of the thing. The rainbow doesn't belong to the new age. It belongs to us. It's the, the rainbow is around the throne of God. And, and, and the things of spiritual encounter are our inheritance, not the enemy's playground. And so where the enemy has stolen things and distorted them and used them to distract you, what the Lord wants to do when, when um, he brings us to his word is not put us off by that, but lead us into the truth. See, the, um, again, C.S. Lewis's writings are very helpful in this because he helps us understand that God has left traces of truth in every religious system. His mercy is so great that he leaves no one without a point of access. For example, every religious system has some form of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's, it's a universal principle. And so... What the Lord has done is to say, I'm going to leave hints, I'm going to leave uh, doorways in every religious system, in every belief system, and, and they're doorways to truth. And since Jesus is the truth, if they'll go through that door, eventually they're going to end up at me. See, They don't have to start at biblical truth. They can start at that doorway that's out on the edge of you know, mystical experience or wherever they want to start, or, or a legalistic experience. But if they go through the doorway of truth with a heart to seek after truth, they're going to end up at the feet of Jesus. Does that make sense? And it's God's mercy that has left it that way. He's left traces of reality in every kind of system. And, and it's his way of saying, I, I am wooing those that have no direct access to me, but if their heart is after the truth... He who seeks me will surely find me. And that, that's, that's a really good piece of news. One of the illustrations I've, I've seen of that, or used of that, is how many of you have gone into like a fast food restaurant or something and, and you've seen those big yellow cone things for, for collecting pennies, for raising pennies for some kind of project, you know, where you put the coin in at the top and it just circles and circles and circles and goes forever and ever and finally ends up at the little hole down at the bottom. Well, that's how this is. It's Jesus that's at the bottom there. 
He's the foundation place. And no matter where they start in the process, they can circle around and around and around, but eventually the, the gravitational pull of the truth of Jesus Christ will lend them through that little narrow opening, and they'll find him. So don't be afraid of uh, running into concepts in the Scripture and, and uh, portions of the journey in the Scripture that sound like something that comes from some uh, other distorted system because it's just one of the ways of drawing us, one of the Lord's ways of drawing us into all truth. And um, he will lead us to himself if we set our hearts to seek truth. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Song of Solomon 6, verse 4. The king begins to speak to her now in the aftermath of the dark night of her journey and of her testimony to her friends. The king comes now on the scene and speaks to her and says, Oh, my love, you are as beautiful as Tirsa, as lovely as Jerusalem, as awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep which have come up from the washing. Every one bears twins, and none is barren among them. Like a piece of pomegranate are your temples behind your veil. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines, virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The daughters saw her and called her blessed. The queens and the concubines, they praised her. Who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and awesome as an army with banners? This is the king's declaration over the Shulamite after she has come through uh, the dark night of her journey and, and of her obedience, of her choices to be faithful and lovesick instead of offended and heartsick. And, and he comes and, and he makes these initial um, declarations over her. She's passed through the dark night of testing. She's emerged victorious. She's found the strength in the, in the love of the Lord. Uh, the, the revelation of his suffering gave her the empowerment she needed to press into her own dark night, and she came out victorious. Notice, we'll talk about this more in just a few minutes, but he begins to repeat uh, as now realized fact some of the things that he prophesied over her back in chapter 4. The phrases are identical, but now it's something that has come to some point of fulfillment in her life. It's not only a prophetic promise, there's now a measure of fulfillment because she's come through this uh, journey of perfection and and, uh, development. She's remained unoffended by uh, the process of the journey. This is what is so key, that that if we will meditate on these realities and understand the function of uh, pressure, the function of suffering in our lives as um, a grace from the Lord to expose places in our hearts that would not trust him, to, to walk out of those kinds of offended places, to look to him and to exult in him and to await further revelation, then the the pressures and the struggles of life can begin to be transformative for us. If we do not have a theology for that, if that doesn't become something that is rooted and grounded in your understanding, then you are uh, destined for a life of confusion. Because the, the strategies of the Lord will lead you through these dark night seasons. And if you don't have a, an understanding of his ways and of, he, uh, of how he uses these circumstances to refine you. Some of you are nodding because you, you've already walked through some of those kinds of circumstances, and others uh, have not faced that so much, but I, I, I encourage you, tuck this away. Put this into a little reservoir um, w- with a you know, bookmark on it, <laughs> and, and so that when, when this season comes upon you, you'll be able to go back and say, oh, wait a second, I heard about that somewhere, this dark night thing. Is this one of those? Oh, yeah. Go pull that out and listen to the CD and say, okay, this is that. And it will be helpful to you, I promise you. So he's, uh, the king is now back in the picture. She's given testimony. She's begun to minister to her friends in the grace of his presence. And the king now steps back into the picture and begins to affirm her. He says, oh, my love. 
And, and, and the, the term there literally means my beloved one. And, and these are the, the terms of Jesus' affection. Oh, my love, my darling, my, my precious one, my beloved, my sister, my spouse. He's declaring to her that she is his beloved. He's confirming the perspective that this season of testing was under his leadership. There's, a, there, there's something so profoundly comforting to us when we come out of a season like that or when we find ourselves in the midst of it where we can default back to the romance and say, wait a second, he made a declaration over me. His banner over my life is love. This thing, too, is about love. And, and from the perspective of time, you'll look back over that and you will see that even that dark night was a gift of grace because his intention was to draw you deeper and, and f- more fully into his love and into his purposes to see that he really is enough for you. His declaration, for example, in Isaiah 62, verse 4, I'm not going to call you forsaken any longer, but you shall be called Hephzibah, for the Lord delights in you. Now, I'm not sure anybody would like you know, really want the literal name Hephzibah, but the Lord delights in you, you know, take that. The Lord delights in you. To have that as your name, the the thing he calls you, the one I delight in. He says, you're as beautiful as Tirzah and as lovely as Jerusalem. And in these these following phrases, he's talking about the two uh, capital cities of the northern and southern kingdom at this time. They were the, the city of Tirzah was more representative of the of the, the uh, Canaanite kingdoms, but it was a, a a dwelling place of King Solomon in the in the the joint kingdoms, and Jerusalem was the main capital city, the center of national worship. Jesus calls it the city of the great king. And I love that, that declaration in Matthew chapter 5 when he's talking about Jerusalem and he, and he says, don't, don't swear by Jerusalem. You have no idea what you're talking about. Jerusalem is the city of the great king. And when Jesus is, is sitting in the midst of the squalor of the, of the then current expression of the, of the city of Jerusalem, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, it's a, it's a beautiful city, but it's a mess. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on in different religions and the places of, you know, the, the, the places of religious historicity and all of those kinds of things. They're, they're, they're kind of a mess of marketing and, and tourism and all this kind of stuff. And, and some of it's really unique and some of it's beautiful and profound. The Wailing Wall is just amazing. The Temple Mount, all those kinds of things are just amazing. But in many respects, the city's a mess. But Jesus said, that's not what I see when I see it. I see the city of Revelation 21. I see the city of the great king. I see the city in the way that my father intended it, the dwelling place of the king in the beauty of holiness, that city coming down adorned as a bride, fit for the presence of the king. And when he's making this pronouncement over the the Shulamite, he's saying, that's the city I see you as. You are as beautiful, not as the current expression of Jerusalem, but as beautiful as the city of God will be in that day as it comes down dressed as a bride. You are my dwelling place, is what he's saying to her. In this journey, you have uh, allowed your heart to be prepared and cultivated and dressed and remodeled and renewed in such a way that now the king has a place to dwell. Some years ago, I, uh, I had a, a powerful dream. It was a, a few years after my father had passed away. And, uh, uh, but in this dream, I was sitting in my house uh, I knew it to be my house at the time, and I was kind of in my favorite place. I have a reclining chair where I do my devotions. I have my coffee cup and my laptop and have my devotional stuff, and I'm praying. And, and that was the, the setting of this dream. So I'm in there, and all of a sudden there's a knock on the, on the door of my house, and I, I go to open the door, and it's my father standing there. Only he was young and vibrant, and, and, but I knew it was my father. And I knew in the dream that it was a representation of Father God. And uh, there were three huge men with him, and I knew them to be angelic representations, you know, angelic beings. And, and my heart was filled with gladness and terror at the same time, because uh, I opened the door, and it was my father, and he just comes walking in. And I knew in the moment, I knew it instinctively, that he'd come to move in. 
and, uh, and, and it was awesome and terrible and wonderful and frightening all at the same time, just that, that kind of the, the sense of the fear of the Lord, you know. And, and he comes in and he looks around and, and my immediate thought is, wow, I hope he likes the place, you know, because <laughs> it was obvious he was going to move in. And he looked around the rooms and, and kind of looked through the place a little bit and then he looks at me and, and, and the expression on his face was tender and terrible. And he said, this is not going to be nearly big enough. And that was the end of the dream. And, and it was a... a Ooh, you know, it was, it was like a, a wonderful, horrible sensation in my soul as I woke up out of that dream because I knew that the Father was moving in and I knew that there was going to be drastic renovation that was happening in the process, right? How many of you know if, you're, if your house is going to be remodeled so that a king can live there, there's going to be drastic renovation unto beauty and it's going to be terrible before it's wonderful, Right? You know that? And, and, and that's, what, that's what's happened in the Shulamite's heart. He said, the, the, the construction's complete. I'm ready to move in. I'm ready to take up residence in the heart that I've created, in the garden that I've created as my home, as my resting place. And, and the, the reconstruction has, has done its job. You've cooperated with it. You've trusted me. And your heart now has become the city of the great king. In Scripture, the city of God is, is ultimately both a place and a people adorned with God's grace and power. Look at Revelation 21. I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and will be their God. Man, that is our destiny. That, that is where we're headed in reality. It's really going to be there. We're really going to live in that place, in that amazing city. I'm so excited right now. I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but somehow I got in touch with the, the reality that the IMAX people are uh, working on a, a, a feature-length film on the city of Jerusalem. And uh, it's going to be out for release uh, next summer. I'm, I'm so excited about it. I just got an email update that the, 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 the filming is complete now, and they're getting ready to do the editing work, and, and uh, massive new film on the, the glory of the city of Jerusalem. I can't wait to see it. What the Lord, what there is now, and, and I hope they try to go to what the Lord has in mind. I don't know whether they're going to do that or not, but anyway. She's been prepared as a city for his dwelling. Bottom of page two, Jesus affirms the power of her influence. You are awesome as an army with banners. Now again, we started out on the, on the first session of our, uh, of our course here, we started out with uh, this passage of scripture as a sort of a motivation for undertaking the journey, knowing where we're going so that we have the, the courage and the focus to embrace the process. And again, so that he, is, he is reaffirming to her now, you are awesome. You're the, you're the place of my dwelling. You're awesome as an army with banners. And he's saying uh, the, the army with banners is the army that has gone out, has engaged the battle, has engaged the enemy, and has emerged victorious out of the battle. I love to meditate on that verse because an army with banners, in its victory, um, you know, an army that goes into war doesn't ever come out unscathed. You know, we don't ever come out of a battle squeaky clean. You know, if the army came back from battle and all of their armor was shiny and none of their swords were dinged and no one was injured and all of the helmets were just as shiny and new as they started out with, you'd think, I don't think you were really in a battle. I think you went down the road over the horizon, uh, you know, took a little break at a national park and then came home and lied to me, you know. Uh, the army that has been victorious in battle is probably torn up a little bit. But the banners are waving. And the watchmen would stand on the wall of the city and they would look out over the horizon, out of their place of intercession. They've been praying for the bride in her battle. And all of a sudden, the first thing they see is those banners waving in the breeze and they know that she won. She did it. 
And there's great celebration, there's great rejoicing. The hope of the city has been uh, upheld and, and restored because the army has been victorious in battle. And, and the, the, the soldiers, the wounded ones, and the victorious ones, they come back into the city and they're, they're heroes, they're objects of affection, and objects of celebration because they've been to the battle and they won it. That's what he's saying over her. He said, I, I know the journey you've been through. I led you into it. I, I wanted to see the spirit of the warrior come through in you, and you did it. You faced the enemy. You faced the discouragement. You took it on. You went there in the hope of my calling. You depended upon my grace and on my mercy. You weren't offended when I withdrew from you, when it seemed to you like I left you alone to face the enemy in your own strength. I really didn't, but it seemed that way to you, and you were faithful. You looked around. You couldn't find my presence, but you obeyed me anyway. You're awesome. The king said, that's how I was in my obedience to the Father. You're just like me. We can be partners now. We can walk together. You're the one I've been waiting for. You're the bride that I chose. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. I can't resist you anymore. Now in, in this kind of place, when you pray, I have to say yes. I have to just answer you. And see, there, that's the promise of the Lord. There's no doubt in my mind that every one of us have yearnings, places of yearning in our heart where we want to see God work, where, where we have run into the wall of the enemy's resistance. We've run into situations with people or circumstances or relationships that are, that are difficult and hard. That is the journey that we're on. And the Lord says, I want you to press into me. I want you to not be offended. I want you to look to me. I want you to wait for my grace. Touch my heart. And there will come a time when you're victorious in that battle. And I will uh, hear your cries and I will answer you because I have committed myself to answer the prayers of a bride like that. You walk in my ways. Let my word dwell in your heart. See, if he answered all our deepest prayers... Early on in the pathway, we'd never get transformed. We'd never face the circumstances that, um, that would change us into his likeness. And, and so it's those dark night seasons that are so important. They're, they become our best friends. It... it, it the understanding of this transforms us in such a way that we can look at the things that resist us and say, you're helping me right now. Because without this, without the resistance that I'm experiencing in this moment, I would never be driven to a deeper place in God, the fruit of which is going to be the certainty that my prayers will get answered. Am I making sense? And I realize that, that, that some of you are, are in the aftermath of those kinds of circumstances, some of you are in the middle of that, and some of you have yet to come to it. But I tell you, the principles are true. She has gained authority in prayer, power over the king. The king can no longer resist her glance, can no longer deny her desires. Look at point two on page three there. Number two under B. What overwhelms God? He spans the heavens with his hand. He calls the stars by name. He calls the sustenance of the universe the mere edges of his ways. I love that verse, Job 26. It's talking about, you know, God begins to reveal himself to Job and, and, and to his friends. And, and uh, it's talking about the sustenance of the universe. How God hangs the stars on nothing and, and holds the universe in place by the word of his power. And then it says, these are the mere edges of his ways. <laughs> He sustains the universe as his side job. The thunder of his power, who can comprehend? And, and a lot of commentators are agreed that it's talking about the power of the incarnation when the word becomes flesh. He does all this other stuff as the side job, but his main focus is turning us into his image by the power of Christ. 
All of that stuff doesn't move him. The strategies of earthly kings don't move him, Psalm 2. The armies of his enemies are nothing. But the gaze of a lovesick bride flips his heart up, unhearts him, ravishes him, messes him up, causes him to bend his power toward her. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, one link of your necklace. John 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. Is this making sense? Beloved, this is our destiny. This is what he has for us. And this is why it's so essential that we comprehend the journey and embrace it and, and not, uh, not become offended as the circumstances of our journey stack up against us. It is, it, it's his blessing. It's his grace in our lives. His desire for us, I, I just tell you, there's something in a father's heart that wants to be defeated by his children. You know, it, it's, a, it's a wounded father that doesn't take pleasure in a son who surpasses him. It, it's a, uh, the glory of the father is to see the son take his place and surpass him. And it's the glory of a bridegroom to have a bride whose beauty is so overwhelming that he has to be bent to her desire. We see the distortion of that in the New Testament. Remember in, in, uh, in the gospel stories when John the Baptist is put into prison and the king you know, is sort of intrigued, King Herod is sort of intrigued by John the Baptist's ministry, and so his wife... The seductress, the New Testament picture of Jezebel, sends her daughter to seduce the king by an exotic dance. And she does that, and the king is so overwhelmed that he says, I'll give you anything you want. That's the distortion. That's the enemy's distortion of the bridal picture. The real picture is like in the book of Esther. Esther comes to the king. He set a law in place. The law of the Medes and the Persians couldn't be changed. He'd set a law in place that the Jews are under condemnation. But Esther's his beloved. Esther's his chosen one. And she comes and does the banquet of wine. She ministers to him. It's a worship service. She comes and recalls their, the, the, the night of their betrothal. And she offers him the cup of wine again where he said, everything I have is yours and everything you have is mine. I am yours and you are mine. Will you choose me? And she goes, it says again, I choose you. And he goes, oh. And his heart is beating and his heart is overwhelmed and he loves her and he can't wait to answer her prayer. And, and, and he says, whatever you want, tell me what you want. I'll give you half my kingdom. And she says, let's do this again tomorrow night. And he's going, ah, I wanted to answer your prayer tonight. She comes back tomorrow night, ministers to him again in the same kind of way, the banquet of wine, the celebration. And he says, Esther, tell me, whatever you want, I will give you anything up to half my kingdom. And then she presents her prayer request. And Esther becomes the one that rules the kingdom. From that point on in the story, the king looks at Esther and says, what do you want me to do? What do you want? See, beloved, it's the glory of the bride. It's the glory of the king to be overcome by a bride who agrees with his agenda. <laughs> if we understand that, if we come to understand the power that he has given to us in the place of surrendered worship, and we come and minister to him, that's why we call it intercessory worship. We come and we minister to him. His heart is messed up. He leans close and he says, oh, tell me anything. Ask me anything. I'll do it. I'll shift heaven and earth in favor of the bride who has won my favor. It's the whole point. It's the, the, the destiny in our journey. Bottom of page three, major point three. Jesus affirms the maturity of her character. He begins to, to uh, recall the declarations, the prophetic promises that he made over her back in chapter four. Now they're no longer promises. They are beginning to emerge in her mature character. Her dedication has been demonstrated. How many of you know that there's a, a time where the prophetic promise over our life